several weeks ago as we're going through our Bible reading. We looked at the beginning of the book of Job, and now we're ending the year looking at the very end of the book of Job. Um, I preached from Job chapter 1, um, where we looked at Job as being a man who was worthy of testing. And the testing he went through was very, very intense. Um, it all began because Satan kind of came up to God and said, look at this guy. You know, he's so righteous, but it's only because he's been blessed materially. You've blessed him in so many ways, and that's the reason why he's righteous and he follows you and obeys you. But God said, no, you don't understand, Satan. It's not about that. You know, righteousness and obedience is not a payback for God's blessings. And God said, you've got it all wrong. And so Satan says, well, what if we take away the blessings? What if we take them away? Then he will turn his back on you. And God said, go ahead, try it. And so God took his hand off of Job and allowed Satan to be able to take away everything that he owned, all his possessions. He was a very rich man. He owned many, many things. Um, even his children died. Um, even his own health was, was affected. And beyond losing all that, he lost his honor. This was a man that was looked up to as a leader in his, in his community. And people despised him for the stuff that he went through. They, they just said, oh, the, what a shame. This man was so great, and now he's got nothing. And people turned their backs on him. And even his wife said, just curse God and die. Just, you know, and his friends came. And they started giving him all of these explanations about why all these bad things happened. They had no clue what they were talking about. And they did more harm than good. Because even Job is saying, you guys are hurting me with your words. You're supposed to be here to comfort me. But the things you're saying are are sending me into more of a spiral downhill. You know, he was all alone. And so through all of the Job maintained his innocence. You know, he didn't curse God for what it for what had happened. Most of the world believes in a thing called karma. They say you you get what you give. Whether it's good or bad, it comes back around one way or another. And it's an easy way to explain things when things happen, but it doesn't really explain why bad things happen to good people and why good things happen to bad people. Because there's a lot of exceptions to the rule of karma, and it just doesn't work. We try to make it work in certain situations, but it's not something that truly exists. So when bad things happen to us or happen to others around us, once the shock lifts, we're left with a response. We have a response. And the response will send us in either of two directions. Either it's going to send us to be angry at God and to blame him and to push him away. Or that tragedy is going to allow us to move closer to him and trust him and hold on to him through faith. Because we know that he's holding on to us, even if we don't understand it. A week ago yesterday, one of the teachers at our school buried her middle child. It was her second of three kids to pass away at a young age, both in traffic fatalities. And a year ago, her husband died of cancer. So she's lost two kids and a husband in the last three year period. And Kim, who is up here, is good friends with her. They teach together. And Kim was talking to Sherry after the funeral last Saturday. And Sherry said, well, tomorrow I'm gonna go to church and I'm gonna sing in the choir. And that's what we do when tragedy hits, we go, we sing. Some might go and sing the next day. Some might need a little time to go and sing. We're all at different levels of dealing with the grief, but that's what we do. We go and we sing. I like those words that Sherry shared last week about that. We refuse to let the evil and suffering harden our hearts. Sometimes we need to just say, God, I need you to hold my aching, bleeding heart. And we give it to God and we say, help me, help me get through this because it's very difficult for me right now to keep taking those steps on. And with the comfort that God gives, we're able to go on. And that's what matters is our response to tragedy. When Job was hit with the loss, he stated the famous words we find in Job 121 and we'll sing a song based on that in a little while. But he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter what. God gives, blessed be the name of the Lord. God takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what faith is. Not just loving God on the sunny days, 
but loving him on the rainy days is all. And no matter what I wake up to or what I go to bed with, blessed be the name of the Lord. That was the lesson that Job was able to show through his faith. And it's an example for us to be able to bless his name. It doesn't mean that we're not sad, we don't grieve, and we're not confused or we're depressed or we feel even just like we're paralyzed at times. But it means that we still bless his name and know that he is with us. We have a God in heaven who suffers with us. He's not up there sending the suffering on us, but he suffers with us because we have a God who has suffered too. He's not going to ask anything of us that he hasn't gone through himself. And he knows firsthand what it is to suffer. We just celebrated the birth of God on earth, right? And what happened to God on earth when he was here? At the end of his life, he suffered. And he suffered many things, but he was obedient. And he blessed his father's name up in heaven. And what more can we do to be able to follow that example as well? And Job's friends came to him. They had lengthy explanations why the tragedy came. And, but their answers were void of truth. And they were certainly void of compassion. Job couldn't get the occasion to add up in his own head. He looked to God. He said, God, why? And God answered him. But not with an answer, but with more questions. God starts asking Job about 100 questions about the mysteries of the universe to prove the point that there's God and there's man. We're worlds apart in many ways, even though God brings us together. But there are things of God that are beyond us, things of God that we can't comprehend. We don't see the big picture. We don't see behind the scenes. Job never knew and God never told him that Satan and God had this little thing going up there in heaven. You know, that was all hidden from him. You know, we don't understand always why the bad things happen. We don't know the source of them. But God asked Job all these questions. He says, where were you when I put the earth together? Have you ever told the sun to rise in the morning? Have you ever been to the source of light? Have you ever been to the source of darkness? Have you ever been to the storehouses in the clouds where all the snow comes down? Have you ever told the clouds, go ahead and let those raindrops fall right now? And they did it. Did you ever tell the lightning to flash? And did you design the zigzag patterns that were there? Are you there when the wild animals give their birth? Do the wild animals come up to you and say, oh, I'm having my baby now. You can come and watch. No, they go to a secret place to be able to do that. God says, can you go out and tame the giant whale out in the middle of the sea? No, they can't be tamed. So God gives him lots of questions and reminds Job that there are some things that are beyond the realm of understanding. Just even in nature, there's things we don't understand. Of course, you know, you can Google these things and figure some of these things out now because we're so smart these days, but we still don't have control over all of these things. And God says to Job, the problem of evil and suffering is one of those things, just like the lightning zigzags, that we can't control and we don't really understand. Accidents happen. Bad people cause tragedies. Mother nature brings a lot of deadly disasters. The world's under a curse, let alone that the evil one, Satan, is out to deceive and to steal and to kill and to destroy. There are so many forces of evil out there that it's amazing that more bad things don't happen than do. Obviously, God is stopping a lot of stuff from happening because it could be way worse than it is. And so, and so instead of us trying to tell God how to run things, we sit back and we go, oh, oh, oh. You know, we start to see the humility of what we need to respond in because we see how little control we have over the universe and over the problem of evil and suffering. But God revealed himself to Job. God said, this is who I am. He didn't give Job answers. He gave him more questions. And we listen for answers. We're like, God, give me an answer to my why. But God really rarely ever gives us those answers. We rarely ever know the whys of why bad things happen. Sometimes we see some reasons or we see some cause and effect and we think, well, this, this bad thing happened and some good things came out of it. 
And I don't believe that necessarily that, that God's out there orchestrating good things out of bad things, but he, he allows it to happen. He makes good things happen out of bad things, but we can't just say, oh, that bad thing happened because God wanted this good thing to happen. I don't think they balance each other out on a scale like we try to understand it. Bad things just happen. That's the world we live in. But the good things can come out of it. And sometimes we see some things that help us to, to reconcile the bad things because we see some good things and it kind of gives us a little bit of calm and peace that, you know, well, at least these good things happened out of it because actually when bad things happen, a lot of bad things happen as a result too, you know? So if we try to put things on scales, we end up driving ourselves crazy because it just doesn't make sense. So let's put away our scales when it comes to trying to understand the cause and effect of good and bad and explanations. But let's do as Job did here. You know, the suffering in this world can help us grow deeper as a person. We have scars from the suffering in this world. It's part of being human. Suffering helps us live by faith. Suffering helps us, helps us to be able to be examples to other people when they're going through, through hard times. We can connect as humanity with one another because we've all gone through suffering, even in different ways. It allows us not to feel alone. It allows us to be able to, to love people that are going through suffering. It allows us, us to be loved when we're going through suffering. It can even lead people often to a saving faith in Jesus. A bad thing happens in their life, and that's when they really finally get serious about their relationship with God. So there are some good things that happen out of it. But Job didn't see any good coming out of his situation. He couldn't see any positive cause and effect that was going on in that situation that he was in. And Job's friends, he demanded, they demanded, they said, Job, you need to get an answer from God. Why all this suffering is going on? But instead of getting answers, Job got vision. Instead of getting answers with his ears, he saw something with his eyes. And I think that's what we need to do when we face the problem of evil and suffering is to quit listening or trying to get that answer from God, but open up our eyes. Let's get a view of God that's, and see the world and the suffering through God's eyes. And the only way we can see it through God's eyes is by getting to know God and to being able to try to see the truth as he sees it. God, Job began to see God with his own eyes and see more clearly who he is. And before these tragedies, Job had a faith in God. He lived for God. But now Job found God in a new and deeper way. He could see God. And instead of looking for answers from God, he saw God being right there with him in a very amazing way. We read the passage earlier. I'd like to just read this again just to remind us of what Job said. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He's, he's establishing God's power and omnipotence, right? Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job is saying, there's so many things I don't understand. And I think I can figure it out. And I put things on the scales and try to make an explanation. But, but these things are beyond me. So hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. It's okay to ask God why, but let's get the answers with our eyes. He said, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. That sounds really strong. I despise myself. But he said, I understand that when I'm trying to figure this out all by myself, that I'm, I'm unworthy of being able to do that. But I want to see you, God. I want to see you in the presence when these bad things happen. And that's what he was able to do. I have another clip here that I'd like to see from a guy down below to be able to help explain some of this problem of evil and suffering as well. Let's watch this. Why would, why would a good God allow bad things to happen? Why would a good God allow bad things to happen? This is a universal question. And for some of you, this question, or when you began to wrestle with this question, it marked the end or the beginning of the end of faith for you. But the interesting thing about this question is when we ask it, and we've all asked it, I've asked it. When we ask this question, isn't it true that we're focused on the bad out there? 
and not the bad in here. So, so let me ask a kind of a follow-up question. Have you, don't, don't raise your hand, have you ever done anything bad? In other words, I've never heard anybody make this case, maybe, maybe you have, how could a good God allow me to happen? Here's another version of it. If God was good, he would have done something about me by now. But I think if John were here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, who wrote the fourth gospel, John who followed around Jesus around, John who saw everything Jesus did and heard everything Jesus taught, John would say, wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, because I, John, he would say, I saw something that might help you with that dilemma. I saw God in a body coexist with evil, men and the god that i saw in a body did not prove that he was god by eliminating all evil he did something else he loved me and then he went to work eliminating the evil in me john who spent time with jesus would say i know it's a big emotional thing i know it's a big emotional question i'm not sure i can sort it out for you all i can tell you is this i saw good god and i saw evil and they can coexist, but it's nothing like you might imagine. What would it really look like if God stopped evil from happening on a practical level? I think through my own sin, when I, I think in my own mind, some of the things I want to do but don't do, what if God knew my thoughts and stopped them? You know, how many thoughts would I have? Uh, what if God zapped me with a bolt of electricity every time I actually went to commit a sin? I mean, the universe would just be paralyzed. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to leave my apartment in the morning. Most people wouldn't be able to live. And so I think that because God values freedom, he enables there to be some of the consequences of that, which is our actions uh, hurting other people and leading to brokenness in the world. If there really is a God, we have to begin to look at things from his perspective. We have to ask the question, does God value a response from human beings? Is, are we just on autopilot where we're living out a completely predetermined script and that God's orchestrated and involved in every detail? Or is there something that God actually wants, which is a free response from our hearts? And you see, as Lewis famously said, if a state of war in the universe uh, is a price worth paying for human response, then it must be worth it. I think. Jesus answers the longings of our heart and invites us not into a thought experiment, but a relationship where he promises to be with us rather than fix everything or answer everything. And at the end of the day, I think it's that relational component that we actually ache for.